because this is the this is the beginning of the second eight week of the 16 week uh, semester. So starting from now, we are actually getting into assembly language programming. Woohoo! Okay. <clears throat> Now you guys are not, you know guys, you guys don't seem excited at all. <laughs> okay, so what we do today is we are going to introduce control structures. In other words, the first part of this module, okay, let me pull up the uh, HTML version. Well, I don't know. This version actually has its own advantages. We'll see. The, um, the source is rendered better in the HTML, I mean, uh, in the PDF version. As, a, as compared to the HTML version, it's okay either way. You know, it's not like one is not readable, but uh, one I think one version is better than the other one. So what we're going to do for the rest of this entire semester is to learn how to look at a C program, C code, and learn how to translate that into code that will run on the toy processor. Okay. Um, so it looks pretty daunting because you know we got all kinds of you know high level control structure in C and C++ and most other high level programming languages like we got if then else okay I'm just going to go through this real fast here okay so we got the typical if then else statement we got the typical while statement which also can be translated into a for loop in C and C++ we got our post checking loop so these are all constructs that you kind of take for granted in CISP 360 because, you know, they're pretty convenient and you don't have to worry about, you know, the labels, the go-tos and stuff like that. But in assembly language programming, we don't have these control structures. The only thing you can do, the only construct that allows you to say sometimes we want to do this, other times we want to do that, would be the conditional branches, the J, C, I, J, C, instructions and so on. Okay. So what we do, what we'll do now is we'll take a quick look at um, the assembly instructions. Okay, so we go to the processor folder inside the share folder, and um, you can pull up uh, the assembler manual. is useful. So we'll we'll open this up first. Okay, so we'll open up the assembly assembler manual. The assembler manual addresses a few things that you might want to know or might want to get familiar with in order to proceed in this class. And I know I'm recording already, but my mic is in my bag here, so it may not be recording very well. There we go. No, it, it, was, it, it will still be audible, it's just not <coughs> at the optimal you know, volume. Okay, so with this one, we just kind of move forward. There's the syntax. Um, so we have the, this is called the mnemonic, which is just a name that you can use in order to specify an instruction. And the other side, you know, in C++ comment is the equivalent code in C++ so that you can see, oh, okay, the whole instruction is equivalent to an infinite loop that does not get out. Okay, in other words, when you, when you get to that instruction, all further instructions cannot execute. Okay, it just stops. Um, the no op instruction doesn't do a single thing, and then we have a whole bunch of instructions that can actually perform operations. But the only thing is uh, X and Y, they both have to be registers, one of the four registers in the register bank. You cannot directly add something from memory. You cannot store the result into memory with one of these instructions. So if you want to copy anything, that would go to the copying type. So the only way you can initialize a register with a constant of some kind is the LDI instruction, load immediate. Load is the same thing as reading. Okay, so in this case we are reading, we're copying a constant to a particular register. Um, I think the ALU type instructions are fairly straightforward. You know, we don't have to really track down how they execute. But the copying ones, are actually kind of interesting what parts of the processor they actually exercise and how they exercise those components. So we'll talk about you know, some of these instructions today. The branch instructions or the jump instructions are even more interesting because we got the jump type instruction. Let me see if I can turn off the page print layout. There we go, that's better. So the jump instructions are even more interesting because um, they allow you to change the path of execution. Where do I find the next instruction? Jump by itself or jump i, these two, this particular pair, allows you to specify unconditionally go to that other location to execute. 
One spells it out, JMPI, you have to spell out exactly where you want to go and that constant cannot change over time. The other one which is jump X relies on a register to specify where should I go continue execution. So that one does, does allow you great flexibility because where you want to go is determined by a register and you can do calculations, okay? You can use add, subtract and stuff like that to calculate where do I want to go. So the same thing applies to the other uh, instructions, but from here, from JC all the way to JLI, all of these are conditional branch instructions because when you look at the C++ representation, they all make use of the ternary operator, which means what the PC or the program counter ends up with depends on a particular flag. Can be the carry flag, can be the zero flag, the Z flag, can be the sign flag, the S flag, can be the overflow flag, the O flag, or the left in flag, which is the L flag. Okay? But that's the only way you can make a decision. In other words, we have to resort to these really primitive branch instructions in order to make loops, conditional statements, and so on. Okay? So it's not going to be simple. And then we only have one, one more. It's not actually an instruction. Um, it's for memory allocation, so when you say byte and then you give it a, a particular expression, well, it cannot be any ex expression, it has to be a constant. So when you give it a constant, all it does is to reserve a byte in RAM and initialize that location to whatever value, whatever i that you specify in source code. Is that okay so far? Yep. Mm -hmm. So you say that when you use a jump command, it like takes you to a specific like um, register, and it continues executing. Like, wh what does that mean exactly? Like, it means uh, it means exactly this. It means that the program counter is updated with a register, or it is updated with whatever constant you specify. Remember, what the job of the program counter is to keep track of where do I find the next instruction to execute. So by changing the program counter directly, you're basically saying alter the path of execution continue execution over there, whatever you specify for the register or the immediate constant. Okay. Yep. So can you do like jump to L1? Like jump to L1? Yes, you can use a label. So that's the, <coughs> that's the only thing that is not documented in this particular manual. I might have documented it, I just not remember. But you can, you can use labels, okay? So what we'll do today is we'll go ahead and specify the logic to a program to find the maximum of two values, and we'll even assume those values are in registers already. And we'll store the maximum in the third register. How about that? So we'll try to do just that with assembly language code today. But I'm going to make this even harder by specifying you know, the actual instructions and not use the assembler. Okay, so we are not going to use the assembler. Instead, we'll use the opcode table and let me make sure that the opcode table is, in fact, up to date. Mm, e yep, it is up to date. Okay, so this is the opcode table with, which you also have access to. It's a spreadsheet because, you know, it's, this is the best form to look at this. Okay, so we, be, we begin with um, specifying the code in C type of uh, control structure. So we're going to use uh, registers A, B, and C, okay? So these are all in registers already. We're not concerned about copying from memory to register and back and stuff like that. So we'll say if A is less than B, and do you guys want these to be signed or unsigned? Because we have to declare one way or another. Signed, okay? So we can say signed. Okay, so we, these are signed, which means they are the value they contain, we have to interpret those signed. So if A is less than B, I want C to be a, a B, because we're finding the maximum. Else, we do the other one, so A becomes the larger one, so we make C equal to A. Is that okay? Typical code to find the maximum of two particular values and have a third variable to store the maximum. Any questions about this particular code? <coughs> yep. So mm -hmm. C behaves like a 10, pretty much. Um, it is the return value, quote unquote return value. It is the maximum. Okay. 
So C becomes the maximum of A and B. In other words, you know, by the time you get out of the conditional statement, this should be true. So if you want to do an assert, you know, that is basically the condition that you want to assert. Is that okay? All right. So in this class, I'm not going to prove the correctness of this algorithm. You know, this would put, that would belong to another class uh, to prove the correctness of this. I tend, I usually, when I still taught CISP 300, that's the class when I prove the correctness of this algorithm, like mathematically. It sounds difficult, but it's actually easier than most people think it is. All right, so now we want to convert this into assembly code. How do we do this? What do, we, what do you start off with, and how do you structure this program to do this? Okay, so we are going to write some code. Uh, I will write the assembly code interleave, which means I'm going to put comments you know, ahead of on, on each line. So this way we can just kind of interleave assembly code uh, without uh, syntax issues. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, okay, let's do the easy part first, okay, because we are all, we all like to procrastinate and do the easy stuff first, right? So this is a CPR, or copy register. Um, C is the destination, that makes it the first uh, operand. B is the source, that makes it the second operand. And over here we have something similar, CPR, this time we are copying from A to C. Is that okay? So now we have we have to go back here and go like, okay, so how do, how do we deal with the conditional part? Well, we want to continue with the then branch if and only if A is less than B. But how do we know that A is less than B or not? What do we need? We need to compare, which is a subtraction, right? Okay, so we'll say, yep, go ahead and compare A to B. Okay, so after the comparison, the actual difference or A minus B is not stored anywhere. What is actually stored are the flags. Okay, we have the four, the five flags. We got the C, Z, sine, S, O, overflow, and the L flag. Okay, so I know I have to use one of those flags. Which, which one do you think I should use? Sine. The sine flag? The sign flag alone is not sufficient. Remember, you know, the after a subtraction, the sign may not make sense. The carry flag? No, the carry flag is only used for unsigned comparison. Overflow is the other flag that you need. <laughs> the L flag, very good. It is the L flag that we need. Okay? The reason why the L flag is needed is because after a subtraction, the sign may not make sense. So if the sign doesn't make sense, then you cannot rely on the sign itself. Because, it would, but if the sign does not make sense, it's only a boolean, right? It can either be true or false. When it doesn't make sense, it means the opposite of that sign is the correct one, and that's why you use the overflow flag, exclusive, or the sign flag to become the actual L flag. All right, we kind of talked about that already, so you might want to kind of you know, get back to that uh, part of the discussion. Yep. Does L stand for anything? Less than. Less than. <laughs> yep. All right, so we know L is important, okay? So we say JLI, you know, because we can specify a label. Um, where should we go if A is, in fact, less than B? Do we get to the CPR instruction? Very good. So we'll label that as our then branch, okay? So the then branch is here. This is also how you define a label using the assembler, you just you know, specify a particular name for the, for the label and a colon. Is that okay? So this is how you define the label and then the JLI instruction refers to that label. Whatever that label turns out to be, you know, the JL, JLI instruction will utilize that. Okay, okay very good. Um, but this is a conditional branch, which means if A is not less than B, we continue execution here. What should I do when I get there? Go to the other CPR. So we have an unconditional branch instruction to the else branch. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. So we'll put the else here. Are we done? 
what happens after the CPRCB instruction? What happens after this instruction here? As far as the processor is concerned, remember, remember the processor cannot read the comments, right? So all the lines, you know, beginning with slash slash, are they are not interpreted. Yeah. Do we have to halt? We have to halt. But I only one single halt at the very end of an, yeah. an entire piece of code. Yeah. So what do we do now? Jump mm -hmm. to the end. Jump to the end. We want to skip the else branch because if you do not skip the else else branch, it's going to fall through to the else branch. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Because this is really really important. Because you never have to think about this in C and C++ programming because it's already done for you. Okay, At the end of every single then branch, there's an unconditional branch to branch around the else branch so that the else branch does not execute. But when you're doing this in assembly code, you have to do it because if you don't, it will continue with the next uh, CPR instruction. So you have to say, you know, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to call that the end if uh, label here. So this is the end if label, all the way down there. It has to get past the entire else branch. So I think this code will work. But let's just do this. So now that we know what kind of code we need, we need to convert this into actual RAM content, okay? Which is in hexadecimal, they are all basically binary bit patterns. Is that okay? So does everybody understand what, I, what we need to do next, okay? So now we need to look up and find out, okay, um, this is also you know, a comment. So now we need to look up and go like, okay, how do we compare A to B? What kind of binary bit pattern specifies this particular instruction? So what you do is you look up the table, okay, and let me zoom in a little bit because <coughs> people in the back may have some problems reading it. So the CP, CMP instruction is specified right here, okay? So row 35 specifies the CMP instruction. Um, the column A specifies the bit pattern, which means this particular instruction has 16 variations. How do we know it has 16 variations? It has got X, X, Y, Y. Only the first, or the most significant four bits, 1110, is fixed. The other four bits, the least significant four bits, are used to specify which register are we using to compare against which other register? Is that making any sense? Okay. And those four bits, the least significant four bits, are labeled XXYY, which means the XX, those two bits are used to specify register X, which is the first operand of the instruction, and then the least significant two bits, YY, is used to specify the second operand. Is that part okay? Uh, we are comparing a to B, right? Register A is 0, 0. Register B is 0, 1. So the actual code is going to be 1110, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then in hexadecimal, because um, the RAM file to Logisim only understands hexadecimal, so you have to say, okay, but what is uh, the hexadecimal representation of 1110? Zero, 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 0001. What do you think? E1. E1 is correct. Very good. Okay, so we go here and we say, okay, this is corresponding to the to a byte with the content of E1 in hexadecimal or one 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 zero 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 one in binary. Wow, we got one instruction done so far. Let's move on. We're going to do this entire program, okay, just as an exercise. So the next one is J -A -G -J -L -I then, okay. So with this one, it's kind of funny because as the assembler, you are going to go like, okay, let's look up JLI, okay. We're going to look up JLI, which is up here somewhere. So JLI is over here. <clears throat> but the actual instruction is a little bit funky. Um, it says... Um, Okay, so let's handle the code first. The, the, the actual opcode is a 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, which is a 4, 1 in hexadecimal. So that part is, that part we know. Okay, so we go back here and say it is 4, 1. 
weight. But if the instruction is fixed as a constant of 4.1, where do we specify the actual place that we're going to? So when you look at this representation, it goes like, hmm, we are going to, hmm, this one doesn't really say that. We, we, oh, this one actually does say that. Okay, I take it back. Um, let me, let me fix this because this part, the, the plus one should not be there. So take that out. It is already here. If you look at this documentation, this one does specify internal to the process of what is happening. So let's focus on this one again. And the one that we want to focus on is the middle part of the tertiary operator. Okay, the first part is easy. We're just looking at the L flag, see if it's one or zero, zero or non-zero. But what about the middle part? The middle part and the last part are different. How are they different? They're both TC, what is different? The dereference, exactly. So the middle one has a dereference, which means I'm not just copying the PC to the PC, I'm copying what the PC is pointing to, to the PC. I'm dereferencing and then storing it. Is that okay? But by the time I execute this instruction in the microcode engine, the program counter has just moved past the byte specifying the 41. So whatever byte you place after the 41 specifies where we want to continue execution. Is that part okay? Okay, we'll run this code and, and figure out exactly what it does, okay? So for now, we'll just say that, okay, 41 is the first byte of this instruction, but there's a second byte here. Um, but since I don't exactly know when it is, I'm gonna say here, okay, fix me. Then, it's a reminder, okay? It's a reminder to the assembler itself to go like, okay, the label then has not been encountered yet. So it is not defined yet. I will fix this when I know what then is. Is that okay? <clears throat> All right, so we'll move on. I forgot to do one thing that's also important. This is location zero in RAM. This is location one in RAM. In other words, I have to kind of manually keep track of how many bytes are being used at this point, and where is the next instruction go? Is that okay? All right. So this is going to take up two bytes because we have the second byte here to specify the <coughs> destination of this particular branch. So what do you think this instruction start at? As a zero three three because zero one is the first byte of the JLI instruction. Zero two is the byte that will contain the address of then, which is not determined at this point. So that's why the first instruction of the JMPI instruction is on location three in RAM. So once again, we look up the table. JMPI has an opcode of four zero, okay? So zero X four zero. And once again, we have a fix me because the else label has not been encountered yet at this point. Is that okay? Yep. Um, yes, it will reserve one byte. But the, the, the space between the colon and the label? The white space. The white space? Oh, that's just for visual purposes. Yeah, anything to the right hand side of a slash slash is really just for uh, us to read it easily, more easily. Okay. So we skip all the lines that start with slash slash because they're basically comments. Ah, I can see the then here. All right, cool. So if I see the then here, uh, where is this location? Zero it's zero, four, uh, zero 05 already. Uh, then equals to zero 05 in, hexade in hexadecimal. Is that okay? Because zero 04 belongs to fix me uh, colon else. So by the time we get to this label, which is the byte that is not yet used, has a location of zero 05. Is that okay? Aha, but somebody said uh, fix me then. Okay, I can fix that now. So now I can go back to here and say, aha, okay, I can, we can fix this one. So we can say it is zero 05 at this point. I'm gonna keep the fix me just so that we can track that at one point we did not know about it and then later on we resolve it. Okay, now we have the CPRCB instruction. 
Look up the table, CPR, okay, that's row 20. So the pattern of this instruction is kind of like the compare instruction, um, except the code is slightly different. So we got a 0, 1, 0, 1 as the most significant 4 bit, so that would give us a 5 in hexadecimal. And then we have the XXYY, okay, depending on which two, uh, which register is copied to which other register. I believe this one is a CA, I think. Is it CA or CB? CA. It's a CB, okay? So if it's a CB, that means XX has to specify C, which is zero. which is one zero, and then YY has to specify B, which zero. is zero one. So that means the XXYY is one zero zero one, or known as nine as a hexadecimal digit. So we got five nine as the byte in hexadecimal. Five nine. So this is uh, this is location five. And it has a content of 5.9. And then we have a unconditional branch. And this one we kind of know already. So this is location 6. It has a JMPI instruction, which has an opcode of 4.0 to begin with. But then we don't know where it is and if at this point. So we say fix me and if. Are we doing OK so far with the assembling, assembling uh, process? Yep. I thought that you made 0, 05 then. What, or what did you do there? Yeah. You said then equals zero five, and the next location was also zero five. Yes. Why? Because you're because you're you're you're, you're tracking. Okay, so let's say you have a notebook where you put uh, one instruction per page. Okay, so you use a page, you use a page, you use a page, and you know the next page has the instruction that should be labeled then. Okay. So, but you encounter the label first. You encounter, and you encounter the label on that page first, and then you fill in the content. So that's why the bookmark is marking that page that is yet to be used. Okay. So we keep assembling, and we go to else here. All right, cool. This is location six, seven, eight. This is location eight. So we know the else label now has a value of zeros 8. OK, I said 8 and then type 7. There we go. And we also realized that earlier we have a fix me for this location. So now that we know where this location is, we put it here you know, and just say, OK, yeah, now we know it is 0, 08. Cool. Now we go to this instruction. And it is not too difficult anymore. This is location 0, 08. And we know this instruction is similar to this instruction here. It will start with a hexadecimal digit of 5. But since we're copying A this time to C, it's going to have 0x58 as a hexadecimal code. Because A is 1000. Zero, zero, zero. The 10 zero specifies register C, and then the 00, zero specifies register A. Is that OK? I can, I can see how you guys are already feeling very enthusiastic about the rest of the semester. <laughs> we'll be just be doing this the whole eight weeks you know, from here on. OK, so now we have this location. And this is location 09. So we say, and if it's 09. And then we realize, oh, we got to fix me here. So this one is 09, like that. And that's the end of the entire program. And it would be a good idea to put a halt instruction here. So the halt instruction also has its own opcode. Um, it is up here. The halt instruction has an opcode of 0, 1. OK, very good. So we put a 0, 1 here. And the location is 0, 9. The content is 0, 1. There we go. OK, that is the process of assembling a program. Cool? No, not really cool, but <laughs> the next part is cool. Watch this. Oh, that's just the documentation. I'm going to pull up the assembler right there. Okay. We go to the source tab. And it's OK to erase the content. So you can block select a whole, a whole bunch of stuff on the first column, column A, 
and then press the delete key, that's perfectly okay. And then we just do this. Okay, you go like, okay, so we look at the output, we got it all done. You don't. You don't think this is cool. You don't think saving you like ha at least half an hour is cool, because the assembler can do this. The assembler just did exactly what we did by hand. I'm pretty sure it has the same code. Huh? Yep. So for the second, right there. Put it up side by side. So at location zero zero, we have the content of E one. At location zero one, we got the content of four one and zero five. Location zero three, we got the content of four one four zero and eight zero eight. Location five, we got the code of uh, five nine, which is here. And then location six has four zero zero nine, four zero and then zero nine. Scroll down a little bit. Scroll a little bit. At location eight, uh, we got five eight as the content. At the location zero nine, we got zero one as the content. So the so that's why the assembler is useful because without the assembler, you would have to do this by hand every single time. And you might think well, that is painful. Well, not quite yet. Okay, according to the Klingon Academy, there's something even more painful, which is. How do you get this code into the processor to, to begin with? To us, okay, to us it's fairly easy. Okay, you you create the RAM file. Okay, the RAM file is going to look like this. This is the syntax expected by Logisim, which is pretty easy. Okay, it's just you know you have to use uh, v two point zero raw as the first line, but after that there are just a whole bunch of hexadecimal digits. Okay, just you know you don't have to specify the address because it is sequential. Okay. So it's not, that's not too hard, but if you're in the in the back in the good old days, um, I think it's the Altair computer. So you look up computers, Altair, okay. and you look up that picture. It looks like this. This is the this is the picture of the Altair computer. Um, the Altair computer usually just comes to the, the top portion, <coughs> not really the bottom portion. I don't see a keyboard or any USB port. And trust me, it doesn't have Bluetooth either. Because <laughs> I know how you guys think. It's like, oh, OK, we just use Bluetooth. No, it doesn't have Wi-Fi either. You cannot SSH into it. OK? So the way you enter content into memory is you use those switches. You see this whole big bank of switches here? That's how you do it. One bank of switch controls the address. Another bank of switches will control the content. So you, you flip the switches to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then you, you flip in the, the content, and then you, you toggle one of the switches to store, and then you move the address switches to the next location, flip the content to whatever content is supposed to store, toggle, and then keep going. Yep. What if you accidentally mess up when you toggle? Can you like go back and fix it? How do you leave so? But you have to find out that you enter wrong. So I think those that's what the LEDs are for. You can go to a location and ask, what is the content at this location right now? So as I said, you know, the, uh, the Klingon Academy <laughs> uses this. That would be a kind of interesting and cool, uh, how do you call those things? Parody on Kind Academy. Kind and Klingon, Star Trek. I know it's not the same kind, but you know, pronounced the same way nonetheless, right? <laughs> All right, so let's check out this code. Let's find out whether it works or not, right? So we go back to the assembler table, and this is all done using a spreadsheet, by the way. You know, this is not, the, the spreadsheet doesn't just, you know, have a call in the back end, send the program to somewhere else in the cloud, have the assembler written in C and C++, do the coding, send it back here as a spreadsheet. No, this is all done using a spreadsheet. This is self-contained. Okay. <clears throat> so now what we do is we download the whole thing. We save 
download the pro download the document, just this particular sheet as a CSV comma separated value. And then we save it in the temp folder. We'll just call that find max. Find max csv. The extension doesn't really matter. And then we go run the program. Uh, and let me see. Let me see if we can remember most recently used files. Yep, it does. Cool. So remember the first thing you want to do when you want to load the program here is to click the reset button once first, okay? That makes sure that everything is reset back to the original state. We right click on the RAM module, you say load image, you go to the folder where the image is located, click on that file, click open, so now we have the program loaded. If you zoom in you will see all that code, okay let me zoom in a little bit. You can see these are the same numbers that we had, okay? So the program is now stored. But comparing zero to zero is not a whole lot of fun, okay? So that we, we can initialize, we can uh, inject values into the registers prior to the program starting execution. So we can say, well, let's make this one. Okay, you guys can come up with tricky cases. So let's say you're grading me and you want to come up with the most tricky case of testing this program. Okay. And remember, we are using the sign interpretation. So, what would be kind of tricky? Negative. Hmm? Negative. Okay, you want to use negative value for one of those at least. Um, so, let's say register A has to go negative. Specify a particular negative number. Negative two. Okay, negative two is FE in hexadecimal because it's all ones except for the least significant bit. Um, the other one probably you want to have something that is not negative, okay? So that if I use the wrong flag, it would mess up, right? Maybe two. Two, okay. Zero, two is fine. Okay, so now we're comparing negative two to two. Uh, two is the larger one, so that means two should be stored in the third register, which is register C. Is that making any sense? Okay. So we'll even so store some garbage value here, okay? Uh, just to make sure that you know, we are overwriting it with you know, whatever is uh, correct. Is that okay? So now we go back, we zoom out back into the main circuitry. Um, depending on what you want to do, if you just want to make sure the program does work, yeah, you can just kind of zip through the whole thing. On the other hand, if you want to understand how the instructions work, especially the conditional branch, you might want to single step it until you get to that instruction and then stop and then observe how it get things done. Okay, so that's one thing that you might want to do. That's actually the way to study for this class is to write small sample programs where you have a prediction of how it is supposed to work. Walk it through clock by clock to make sure that it does work the way you think it should. Okay? So in this case, you know, I think the conditional branch is the one instruction that I really want to find out you know, whether it does it the way it's supposed to or not. In fact, we can all sing, we can single step through the entire program. The first instruction is the compare instruction. So when we execute this instruction, the difficulty of tracking it is you have you have to keep an eye on this, as well as an eye on this at the same time. Okay, when I zoom in like this, it's kind of difficult to track. When you are doing this on your own and you have a fairly a good sized monitor like a 1080p typical you know, monitor that's 22 inches, you can see the whole thing. But I can't because you know, I have zoomed in already and this is just you know, XGA resolution to begin with. So your, when you do this on your own, it's a lot easier to see. Okay, the first part here is to fetch the instruction into the instruction register. So when I do a control T and control T, we should see the instruction register containing the opcode of E1. Okay, that's cool. When we clock again, it would go to E10 <coughs> because it's basically indexing into uh, the 16 words inside the ROM that specifies all the microcode slices to execute the compare instruction. This is the first slice. The first slice of the, com of, of the compare instruction should set up the pathways between the register bank and the ALU. It should specify the right registers to be subtracted, it, and it should also store the flags into the, uh, into the flag register when it's all done. 
So this would be a good time to check whether that is the case or not. So you go up here, you look at the <coughs> ALU, and you can check what are we comparing. We're comparing negative 2 with 2. Well, it seems like it's grabbing the right registers, right? And the output is not going to be stored, okay? Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4, but it's not going to be stored. How do we know it's not going to be stored? We follow this wire. It goes all the way back to the input mux of the register, but you can see that the input enable is turned off with the register bank. In other words, no register is paying attention and getting updated in this clock cycle. Is that okay? What about the flags? Are the flags getting output correctly? So you click on this wire, which is specifying a 10100. So now it depends on you know which flag is which flag. You know the least significant bit I think is a C. Uh, the second least significant bit is a Z. So those are all zeros, and that makes sense, right? Because when you subtract two from Fe, should you have a borrow? Fe is one 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 zero as a binary number, and two is one. It's excuse me zero 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 one zero. So you perform that binary subtraction. Should you end up with a borrow? Nope. So the 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 second least significant zero makes sense. There's no borrow in this subtraction. The third one is the sign bit. Negative four is the result. Do you think the sign bit of negative four should be set? Because it's negative. Okay, that's cool. This one is overflow. Is it overflowing? In other words, can I am I supposed to be able to store the value of negative four given that we have eight bits? We can store negative four in in four bits, right? It kind of makes sense that we can store it in eight bits. So the overflow is a zero, which means you know there's no overflow condition. We can store this result correctly. What about the one at the very end? That's our L flag. Does it make sense that the L flag is a one when the sign is a one and overflow is a zero? One exclusive or zero is in fact a one. So now we have just double check everything and it got everything correct. But the output of the flags is not updated yet. So when you look at the output of the flags, it is still all zeros because it needs a rising edge of the clock to store that. And this we are now at the low low part of the clock cycle. Are we doing okay so far? So now when we type a control T, that will conclude this portion of the execution. And the flags is now 1.4. It has just updated itself. That's all it does. Okay. But the ROM is also ready to move on to the next next slice. When you look at the next slice, this is E10. So we want to look at location E11. So when we look at location E11, it is not going to be very surprising because you will see this with almost every single instruction. So E11 has a content of two followed by all zeros. That too means the most significant bit of the output of the ROM connects to a special place. It connects, it's, we're talking about this Y here. It will be set to a one in the next clock edge. It goes through an OR gate into the reset of the micro code pointer. In other words, as I click Control T one more time, <coughs> for a fraction of a second, it will go to E11 in the ROM. But the moment it gets there, the output of bit 25 of the ROM is going to turn to a 1, which then will be OR with the actual reset line. But since it's an OR, if at least one input is a 1, the output is a 1. So if the output of the OR gate is a 1, it's going to reset the microcode pointer back to 0. So we are now ready to fetch the next instruction. Are we doing OK so far with this? So we'll do a control T, just like that. And you can see it just went all the way back to location 0 in the ROM, because now we are ready to get the next instruction at location 0, 1. So if you check the program, the um, instruction at location 0, 1 is the conditional branch instruction. Okay. In fact, we are going to make this branch this time, because the L flag is, in fact, 
set at this point. So this would be a great chance to look at how do we do this? How do we you know, execute this instruction, grab the next location to branch because the L flag is a one, okay? So let's go ahead and follow this instruction too. So we go back to this code and then we do a control T this would grab the instruction, the opcode itself into the instruction register. So when you click on the instruction register, it has 65 as the output, which I think is, uh oh, that is not correct. Oh, it's, this is decimal, never mind. Okay, it is correct, it is a 41 in hexadecimal. The 65 is actually a decimal number, which is 41 in hexadecimal. Okay, so we got it right, <coughs> and then when we clock it, you know, in the next clock cycle, the ROM will go to the location 410, okay, because that's the location of the first slice controlling that particular instruction. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so here's the, the magic of, you know, okay, how do we do a conditional branch instruction within the processor? Because you can't really just you cannot just say if then blah 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 like you would do in C and C plus plus code. This is inside the processor. Everything is in hardware. They're all logic gates, the multiplexers, and stuff like that. So the question is, okay, so how do we do this? So we look at the control signal, and we'll zoom out just a little bit so that we can get a better view of what is involved here. <coughs> So we start with the program counter because after all, it is the program counter that is going to be updated, right? So we look at the program counter, okay, we focus on this guy here, the program counter, which currently has a value of 0, 2, which makes sense because it has moved past the byte of 4, 1, which specifies the first byte of the conditional branch instruction, okay? That part is done by location 0, 0, 1. You know, the, the moment it reads an instruction into the instruction register, it also auto increments the program counter so that it will be ready to read the next location. So having the program counter be in zero 02 is okay. That is also the same location that contains the address of where we need to go when the L flag is set. Okay. We also know at this point that the next rising edge will update the program counter because the enable is already a one. So it is going to update itself in the next rising edge. The question is, what is it updating? What is going, how is it going to update itself? So this is the input to the program counter. And right here, this mux controls the source of the update. How am I going to update myself? Normally, we go for you know, input zero, which is just the incrementing, the auto increment mechanism that your um, music box also has. But this time, when you look at PC MUX, it has a value of one, which means we're not, we're gonna take this input from here. But where is that coming from? Well, it only, it's coming from another MUX, okay? And this MUX is controlled by this little gate here, and this gate is specifying a one as the output, so it's taking this input. Where is that coming from? So this is a long wire, it goes all the way around all the way around, and guess what? It is coming from the data port of RAM. So indeed, we are now using the program counter to specify the address, but we are also using the output of RAM to update the program counter. Are we doing okay so far with this? We are, in fact, executing PC equals to star PC at this point. We are dereferencing the program counter and use whatever location it points to to use the content at the location that it points to to update the register itself. Is that okay so far? Cool. <clears throat> okay, but but, that, but then I have a question. How does it know that it needs to do this instead of maintaining the program counter and not to change anything? So that has to do with the multiplexers, the, how the multiplexers are switching. So the first one is this one here, okay? How do we know that it is not 
um, going to just increment. Okay, so PC mux is connected where? That is the question. So when you look it up, PC mux is not connected here, but instead, PC mux is connected here. Which means PC mux is not directly controlled by the ROM. It is controlled by something that is already controlled in return is controlled by the ROM. So what is what is determine what is going to determine the output of PC mux? It's this wire here. PC mux mux. <laughs> because it is a multiplexer to a multiplexer. That's why it's called PC mux mux. Well, it's just a name, okay? But PC mux mux does come from the ROM. Okay, so this 100 is specified in ROM. What it is specifying is 100, which is 4. This is input 0, input 1, input 2, input 3, input 4. And where are those wires coming from? You track down you know, where those wires are coming from? Where are they coming from? They're coming from the flags register. The flags register is what is going to store the five flags that we use. Carry, zero, sign, overflow, and less than. In other words, PC mux mux can specify pay attention to one of the five flags stored in the flag register and use that as PC mux as an output because if PC mux is a one, then we are not auto incrementing. We are saying, okay, we need something else to update me. That's what PC mux is saying. Just don't auto increment, use something else to update the program counter. But then what is that other thing that is going to update the program counter? This explains what PC Mux is. So PC Mux is this guy. When PC Mux is a one, we are going to use this input to update the program counter. So now we need to rely on another Mux to specify uh, which way are we using to update the program counter. This is an AND gate. And the AND gate is um, doing a AND between PC Mux itself and the negation of R, O, 0, enable. That has to do with, um, and you can see that R register output 0, enable, is off at this point. We are not doing any calculations. So if we're not doing any calculations and PC mux is a 1, then the AND gate is going to output a 1. Is that OK? We need this to differentiate between the cases of, yes, we want a register to update the program counter, as opposed to we want a memory location to update the program counter. That is why R0 EN is a part of the equation. You cannot just use PC mux to uh, control that particular multiplexer. Are we still doing OK so far with this, more or less? Okay, so if you're kind of lost, or you know, you're, you, you have lost track of you know, which one is controlling what else, um, this is how you study, okay? It's after the class, you just kind of go back to the circuit diagram, go through the same sample program, and then with a bigger, larger monitor, keep track of what everything is doing in the processor. Particularly the light green wires, because they are enabling something, so they're all significant. Okay, so now that this is all set up, the next clock cycle, you know, which is a rising edge, is going to update the program counter to five. <coughs> Control T, now the PC is five. What is at location five? Let's check out the uh, mouse pad. Location five is the beginning of the then branch. So the rest of the program is not nearly as interesting anymore because you know, we have already done the compare. Um, this is copy register. Copy register is easy. Okay, we'll, we'll do this one instruction and then we'll call it the end of this demonstration. So we will go and take a look at this one. The next clock cycle goes back to location zero because we are done with the previous instruction. It's going to fetch the CPR instruction. So at this point, the instruction register should have the op code corresponding to the CPR instruction. Uh, five nine is the is the hexadecimal digit, and over here five nine in fact is the code as well. 
and then in the next clock cycle, it will go to location 590 to locate the first lines of microcode for CPR or copy register. Uh, <laughs> I clicked the wrong key. I, I type control R instead of control T. <laughs> it reset the whole thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, the RAM content should be gone as well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but you guys know how to get there, okay? You know, so to execute the CPR instruction. Okay, so the CPR, okay, I can already tell you what the CPR instruction does. CPR is easy. The CPR instruction is focusing on just the register bank itself. So what it's gonna do is it will take this wire, establish a path all the way back here. So in order to establish that path, it has to control this switch so that this output connects to this input here. Nope. This one? Yep. Yep, so it's going to use this particular path so that the output goes through this mux, go through this wire, go all the way around, go back to this um, D multiplexer, and it becomes the input of the same register bank, and then use RI cell register input select to select which register is going to be updated, it will use R O zero register output zero select to control which register is outputting, and then at the, the clock cycle will then copy the register that is driving the out zero port, and it's going to update whatever register we are selecting for the input register. So the CPR instruction is just you know, the register bank itself; it doesn't do anything to the rest of the circuit. All right. Are there any questions? So what this means is, even though I document the instructions, like what they do using text. Okay, let me go back to here. So why, why did I sign out? I didn't sign out. <laughs> All right. It's some kind of time out, but it doesn't make any sense. So anyway, so back to uh, this documentation. This is the documentation, you know, that is user friendly. You know, we are trying to use the C syntax to tell you how things occur, you know, how they work. But to really understand how they work, you can use the processor. The simulator spells out every single operation, every single clock, how things are done. Is that okay? And you are expected to understand it. You're not expected to come up with the processor design itself. That would be a upper division class over at UC Berkeley. <laughs> but to understand, given the design is already done, given that we know how each individual component operates, you are expected to understand how it works. Is that okay or not? Which also means, you know, in the ex in the next exam, there will be questions, you know, asking you, uh, you know, there will be questions to assess whether you understand how the processor itself works and it, while it executes instructions. So, how do you study for that? Well, I should use study. How do you prepare for those questions? Because the conventional way of studying may not work in this class. Play around with the processor and see what it does. Right, so when you so-called play around, you're not actually doing it for entertainment because the word play seems to suggest entertainment. If you find entertainment value in this, I'm not objecting, I have no objection to that. Okay? <laughs> but when you said play, you, you're basically saying- Just Test it around. Test it around, but in your mind, you would have an idea of what it should do, right? Based on your understanding of the architecture, you, you formulate, your theory of, okay, I think this processor would do this in this clock cycle, and this is going to do this in the next clock cycle, and so on, and then you observe whether it's doing that or not. If it, is, if it matches its validation, then your understanding is consistent with the design. If it does not, it's even better, because then you say, oh, okay, there's some, some of my understanding is not consistent with the, with the design. What is it? Because you're you're debugging your your understanding of the processor in that case. 
So that, so absolutely, this is the way you prepare for you know, the exam of this class. It, there's no actual studying, because I can write about the, the whole thing. In other words, the text version is going to be specifying all of these connections in text. That is going to be absolutely dry and boring and not useful. <laughs> okay, So the, the way to prepare for the test is really to exercise and just go like, OK, I'm going to write this program, write this code, see what happens. Okay, The program that I'm writing here is already a little bit more complex than the, the minimal program that you can try to make this code, you know, to test the processor. I'll give you a few um, suggestions of what you can do on your own. It's not a homework assignment. You don't have to turn in anything because I'm already drowning in grading, so I don't need any more water, you know, above my uh, head. So this is what you can do. Um, LDIA with some number, LDIB with some number, and do a J, some, con some kind of condition, okay, to label L1, define L1 over here, give it a little no op instruction, and then give another no op instruction here, or if you prefer a halt is fine, okay, just for testing purposes. So throw in stuff into the question marks. Predict what it is supposed to do. Execute, execute the code step by step and see if your prediction is correct or not. I mean, there's a lot of degrees of freedom here already because you have degrees of freedom in terms of what constants you're gonna put into the question marks, okay? They all have to be from zero to 255, okay? But then you have to think about if the assembler is limited to values only from 0 to 255, how do you specify negative 5? 2's complement. Okay? You have to use 2's complement, apply 2's complement on the side, figure out what negative 5 maps to in terms of bit pattern to a 200 and you know, probably 49 or 250. 249 is probably my, my guess. Find out how it maps to you know, the unsigned version of the same bit pattern. Um, and then the J blah I you know, instruction, you can use one of the four, the five flags, right? You can use the carry flag, you can use the Z flag, the zero flag, you can use the overflow, the sign, and the, else, the, else, the less than flag. All of those degrees of freedom, you know, is helping you to understand how the instructions operate. So this is one program that I would suggest you to play with. Here's another one. Um, LDI A with L1, LD A with A, and then, and, and then do a halt here. Okay. At the location L1, you just say byte. It doesn't matter what you put here, okay? 130. Okay, execute this program. What do you think it's supposed to do? Byte 130 is reserving a byte and then initialize the content of that byte to 130 or the bit pattern, the 8 bit bit pattern of 130. So that one is correct. What about the first instruction, LDIA, comma, L1? What would be the value of A after the first instruction? Yeah, we learned the bit pattern one Nope. No? Nope. It's going to update itself with the label. The label is going to be, this instruction takes two bytes. Zero, one, two, three. So this is four, this is at location four. L1 is the address where it is defined. So when you do a LDI A with L1, A ends up with a value of four, okay? The next instruction is LD, which is load, indirect A into A. So the indirection, which is you know, which I specifically use the parentheses syntax to emphasize this is indirect, means it is dereferencing A to store the value pointed to by A back into A in this case. Now, if you think this is a little bit confusing and you cannot really differentiate what is going on, make it a different register. Okay, that will make it more clear what it is doing. But more importantly. Not, it's not just you know, after the entire program stops at the whole instruction, you figure out what is in A and B. 
it is while the instruction executes, look at the processor, look at the luxes, look at how we control the RAM module, okay? And look at you know, how we establish the paths. Because in this case, what it is doing is it is sending A out from the register bank to control the address bus. So that we can say, hey, register A, you specify where in RAM we should look. The output of RAM through the data bus is going back to the register bank to the input. And then we say, oh, register B, you're going to update based on that. But in between, there are switches. There are multiplexers and demultiplexers along the way. So you should look at that and go like, how do we make those switches, configure the switches, so that that particular path exists? Is that okay? Yep, go ahead. Just a quick question. So LD, uh, if you had A previously, LD, A, A is the same as A equals asterisk A? Okay, so the comment, you know, there's, there, oh, by the way, there are no stupid questions. So don't, don't worry about your stupid questions. Now, there might be questions that have been asked already, but this is not one of those. <laughs> so in this case, A is really just L1. And L1 over here is defined to be 4. So that's why the LDA, LDI instruction is really just initializing register A with a value of 4. The next one is B equals to star A. I'm dereferencing A to store whatever A points to to B. Is that helping? Yeah, that answers my question. Okay, this, this excellent. Is I was just sure. Yep. So the trick is this part here. The next one, you know, it's already documented in the manual, so you know what the, the second instruction does. But the first one is the confusing one: is is L1 referring to the content at the label, or is it really just the label itself? And the answer is, it's just the label itself. Mm -hmm. It's four, but how would you put four in there? You, know? you just type four. Oh. Yep. So this instruction here, the way this is assembled at this point, you can just replace this with a four if you wanted to hand calculate, you know, the whole location thing. But you know, using labels is more convenient. That's a good question too. So are there any other questions regarding you know what kind of test you can do with the instruction set? So you look at all the instructions and you go like, okay, how do I test this instruction and find out how it works? Okay, figure out a very tiny program to do it. Um, let's switch back to the whole instruction set and see which ones you know are the more difficult ones to test. So we have these two, okay, which do not do one. One is basically you know saying, okay, I'm all done. Do not go anywhere else. So you can test this one all by itself. The the, the other one is just no up, okay. And no op is interesting because it has an opcode of zero. In other words, when you execute a no op instruction, it's going to put a zero into the instruction register. But when you decode the zero zero instruction, it will load zero 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 into the microcode pointer. So without using the reset pin, it goes straight back to location zero 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 in the ROM. And that's why the no op instruction is a free instruction. Because it really is just the fetch cycle of every single instruction. It's the first part of executing every single instruction. But by itself, it is kind of an opcode. And that's why you know it's a free instruction. You know, it just turns out to, you know, okay, we can put in as many no op instructions as we want, and the program will still perform exactly the same way. Is that okay? Sort of? I mean, one thing you can do is really to execute a program with five no op instructions and, and look at the micro code pointer, look at the register instruction, the register, uh, instruction register, and see how it gets it done. Okay, how do we ex quote unquote execute the no op instruction itself? Is that okay so far? Okay, so this is the part where one of my classes, CISW410, uh, where you know, half the class will say, so are we supposed to learn this out by ourselves? And then my answer will be, yep. <laughs> because you got all the basic blocks understood already, 
So understanding the basic design is really just exercising it, writing test programs, figure out, figuring out what is supposed to happen and validate and see that it actually happens the way you think it should happen. All right, so what is my job here then? Well, I got something even more fun prepared. So what I have prepared here is some notes that I have written long, long, long ago, but I have revised it for the toy processor. So let's see, is this the right class? Yep, nope, wrong class. Let's see, go back to courses. Nope, the other one, there we go. So when you go to the modules, I have just added an additional module this morning. And it's called Assembly Language Programming. I th yeah, it is already published, so you should have access to it. It has one single module right now. But this module may take, mm, I, would, I would say, maybe a few classes to go through. So this module is about compi compiling control structures for tax toy processor. Okay. And when you look into it, you will see stuff that is really familiar to you. Okay, look at this code here. Does that look familiar to you? You know, it's just an attempt of a typical conditional statement in C. You have C as a condition, block one being some kind of block, you know, a whole block of statements of some kind, and then block two is another block of instructions and statements for the else branch. I'm hoping that this looks familiar to you, because otherwise I'm gonna send something back to CISP 360. <clears throat> is that okay? So now the question is, but this is structured, okay? So the problem with this code is it is structured. It makes it difficult to translate to assembly code because assembly code is not structured. It is flat. So the first thing we do is we get rid of the curly braces, but we don't want to change the meaning of the code. We just want to get rid of the curly braces. Curly braces imply their structure. In other words, block one may be a loop, Block one may have a conditional statement. Block two can be a loop inside which you have a conditional statement. Inside that you have another loop. Okay, that's structured programming. So the first thing we do is we destructure the whole thing. So I want you to take a look at this code here and you tell me whether it has the same meaning as the original code. The original code says C is the condition for the land branch. If it is not true, go to the else branch. The alternative code here says if C is not true, go to L1. L1 is over here, which is corresponding to your L branch. Uh, what if C is true? If C is true, then not C is false. Then it won't do the go to. Instead, it will execute block one. After block one, what is it going to do? It's going to jump, jump to L2, which is past the L branch, and conclude the execution. So is it equivalent to the first version? Yes. It is. Okay. But doing this means we are deconstructing the program in a way to get rid of the structured part of it. Okay? So are we doing okay so far with this? <coughs> One word of warning, don't turn in code like this in your other classes. <laughs> when, you, when you take CISP 400 or 430, you know, and go like, well, since I can do this in text class, I'll turn this into Professor Fox or Professor Subsecretary. They may not like that very much. <laughs> Even though it is equivalent, you know, they may not like the code that is not structured. So this is the only class where you really absolutely have to use go-tos. And if there are no go-tos, if your original conditional statement is simple, it's also simple to translate, okay, just jump around when the condition is false. This is a while loop, okay, this is the original structure, the C version, and this is the, this is the deconstructed version, or the non-structured version. So the non-structured version starts with the label L1 because at the end of the loop, we need to go back to the beginning to re-evaluate the condition. But when we evaluate the condition, we are not checking for C, we're checking for not C so that we know when to get out of the loop. Which means if C is true, not C is false, we fall to the block one, which is the content, the actual body of the loop. At the end of the body of the loop, we have to go to L1 to go all the way back to recheck the condition. In other words, the alternative version has exactly the same meaning, except it doesn't have structure anymore. It doesn't have the curly braces anymore. 
So if you do this to every single block, so within block one, if block one is a conditional statement, you do the deconstruction using the first lines. Um, if, it is, if it's a loop itself, you do this again. So the whole idea is turning your entire program to a form where there are no curly braces. But what about the if blah 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 go to? Well, the if blah 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 go to sounds a little bit like conditional branch to me. It is a branch with a go to and it's conditional based on the condition C. But then you might say, but that condition C can be really complex in a C++ program. It can involve your A is less than B, and B does not equal to C, and da 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 da, the whole bunch, of, whole bunch of stuff. So what do we do in that case? Well, if it is a not, you can translate, you can get rid of the not by making the code itself more complex. So if the original code is saying, if not C, go to label L1, then you can see if C go to a label L2, which is a new label that defines that is defined as a continuation point. But if that if it doesn't go to L2, then you can just go to L1 because the only way you can execute the, the highlighted statement is when C is false. So you still end up at label L1 if and only if C is false, except the code is a little bit more complex now. But you got rid of the negation. Okay. Uh, what if we have an or? Or turns out to be easy, because if the original code says if C or D go to L1, then you can just say, okay, fine. If C goes to L1, if C is false and go through this, go to the second conditional statement, then you say if D is true, also go to L1. This is because C and C++ uses short-circuited boolean evaluation, and this is short-circuited. If C is true, I don't even bother with D. I just go straight to L1. What if we have conjunction? If you have a conjunction, like C and D, then you say, if C is false, don't bother to go to L1, just go to the continuation point, because we're using short circuit evaluation again. Because with a conjunction, if one side is false, it automatically, the whole thing is false. So that's why if C is false, don't bother to evaluate D, just continue the execution. We are not going to label L1. By the time you go to the second conditional statement, you already know that C is true. So in other words, if you ever get here, you already know C is true. So you just have to check whether D is true also. If D is also true, yes, then we have C and D being true. It is time to go to L1. If C is true but D is false, you just fall through to the label L2 and continue execution with whatever is after this, just like the original code. Is that okay? So this section, you know, section four, is basically saying how do we convert conditions that are complex into smaller conditions or smaller expressions, but uh, sacrificing complexity of code in return. So you're using more conditional branches, but the condition of the conditional branches gets simpler. Is that okay? So all of this is really mechanical. It really is just pattern matching, okay? Do we have an and? Yes, okay, do this. Do we have an or? Yes, do this. Do we have a negation? Yes, do this, okay? And then there are some you know, simple deductions, reductions that you can do. Um, not so much with the processor that we have, because the processor that we have has a very limited comparison uh, conditional branch thing. You can only branch when something is less than or something is equal to. What if it's not equal to? We don't have a single conditional branch to do that, but you can turn, you can, you can use these tricks to get it done. <clears throat> so this is a little table, just, just so that we know what to do when we encounter <coughs> less than. Less than is okay. Either signed or unsigned is okay. If it is unsigned, you use JC. If it is signed, you use JL. Greater than, kind of easy. You just put the order of the compare, okay? Less than or equal to? Well, we, we have a less than, but we also have an equal to. JZ is equal to. So JZ and JZI basically would do the equal to. Greater than or equal to, split the order, and then just break it up to less than and also equal to. Not too difficult. Equal to, we can do. And then not equal to, you have to kind of turn it into not equal to. You know, not followed by equal to because if we don't have a single conditional branch, 
but not equal to. So are we doing okay so far with that table? You know, basically, we are, I'm reducing the six common uh, comparison operators into operations that are directly supported by the toy processor. Okay. And you can see the thumbnail is pretty up here. So what else is going on here? So this is something that you should do also over the weekend is to read this as far as you can go because I start off with a particular program like this. Okay, So I want to convert this program into not this program so much. Uh, nope, it's not this program that I want to convert. This program. There we go. So I want to convert this code into assembly code. Okay, we know X, Y, and Z are in memory already, and I want to turn this into assembly code. So what is following this is a step-by-step -step translation. I turn everything into comment. I start to work with the memory allocation first, and then I work with the assignment, the initialization, and then I work with the inside of the portion here, which is Z equals Z, Z plus X. This is how it's supposed to be done. And then this part deals with the um, condition, no, con the conditional statement inside the loop. So th this takes a few iterations until we get to this one here. It's not done yet, okay? So there will be more to come. I was only able to work up to this point, but that's the exercise, okay? How do we compile a C program into instructions that the toy <coughs> processor can handle? All right, so we are running out of time today. Um, I do not have any actual homework assignment other than this suggested exercise for you guys to do and observe you know, how the processor works. Um, we'll move on to the lab. So for those of you who want to kind of experiment with the processor and ask questions, I will be there to answer your questions.